Animals in studio, no less. Hi, Craig. Good morning, Duncan. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm so happy to have you uh, not only talking about this book, but talking across from me. I never get to see the guest in person. It's so cool. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. So if someone said to you, um, Manatee Insanity is, is the definitive historical account of the battles fought in Florida for and against the Manatee, how would you react to that statement? I'd say, well, holy cow, you actually wrote the book. Thank you. <laughs> oh, who said it was me? Oh, who said no? Yeah. <laughs> but um, well, that's what I was going for. That's yeah. what I was going for. It's, it's such a, a, a wild and woolly story, and uh, it's very entertaining as well as, I think, thought-provoking. Uh, so that's I was trying to capture that. And, and with that in mind, uh, maybe um, we can talk a little bit about the you know, the, the, the larger motivation behind the book. I mean, it's one thing to be a Florida native, as you are, and it's nothing to spend a dozen years or so on an environmental beat of, of Florida's largest newspaper, the St. Petersburg Times. Um, and Manatees are pretty darn interesting, no matter sort of who you are or where you are, but deciding to write any kind of book is a you know, serious commitment, and um, I, so I can't help feeling there must have been some sort of major event, major catalyst, something prompting to say, okay, I'm not going to try to write a book. I'm going to write a book about manatees. And by the way, I want to write the definitive historical account of the manatee situation in Florida. So, well, uh, it, in the time I've spent covering environmental issues in Florida, there has been no issue as divisive as the issue of manatee protection. I mean, people are, you know, pretty much one way or the other, and and there's no room for compromise. It's almost like, you know, it's not to the same extent, but it's almost like covering abortion or or you know something like that. And so, uh, wherever you have that kind of uh, passion on either side, that obviously makes for a good story. Yeah. So that was that was as much what you identified as, hey, there is there's a big battle, there's an ongoing battle, and uh, let me let me jump in and try yeah. to chronicle this thing. And and plus there are all kinds of uh, wacky things going on uh, along the way, interesting little subplots, interesting characters. I mean, you know, any story where you can incorporate Jacques Cousteau and O.J. Simpson. That's a pretty. That's a pretty good story. <laughs> no, right. No, and the, and the cast of characters is is, uh, and even spanning not just that kind of range, but um, historically. I mean, just as a relatively you know uh, recent transplant to Florida, just um, you know uh, reading about Flagler, for example, and it's like, well, I drive on Flagler, but I didn't really know that much about him as I probably should have, and uh, so just like seeing, but also how far back the pertinent issues of. Uh, the manatee battle right. really go to yeah. when that guy was sort of laying down his tracks, as it were, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, no, it's it's just. Uh, it's well, just I, I learned stuff too. I mean, I didn't know that as early as 1884, scientists were already saying, you know, we're kind of worried about the manatees. We're we're worried they're about to vanish from the earth. It's like, wow, that far back. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I, I you know, in, in fact, you know, by the time I was at the sort of the final pages of, of this book, that, that reminds me, I couldn't decide if this was. Um, like a, like a sprawling, complicated story with an inexhaustible supply of those colorful, or, you know, or dull characters in some <laughs> cases, spanning more than a century, or one simple story that sort of just essentially kind of recurs, you know, um, every generation or so with, with an interchangeable kind of cast of, of pretty, uh, you know, much the same characters. There's, you know, the people that want you to, you know, to slow down, the people that don't want to slow down, the people who meanwhile want to develop stuff, and I mean, so, did you find that, like, wow, this is, like, over those generations, if you're talking about the 1800s and now we're, you know, 2010, I mean, was it notably different in any of those areas for you, or was it like, wow, this story just kind of chugs along, but a few people change and a few elements change, but um, not really the... I, I think it's both. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not to play the role of Billy Martin here and feel strongly both ways, but sure. um, um, I, I think the thing is that, that the issues regarding manatees have changed from the 1800s. I mean, obviously then they didn't have motorboats running around and they, right. they didn't have uh, lots of marina construction going on on the waterfront. Sure. Sort of thing. But, uh, but the continuing issue, I think for Floridians, is always going to be how much do we treasure the, the, uh, the gift that we've been given of, uh, of this marvelous natural beauty that we mm -hmm. have and what do we do with it? Is it worth saving at all costs or are there things we're willing to sacrifice in order to make some money and make a living and in order to make this a hospitable place for us to live and how do you balance that how do you work out something where you try and achieve both goals at the same time and is that even possible yeah and so i mean that's kind of been to me the, the story of florida all along is you know how do we live here 
How do we right. how do we cope with it? How do we grab for what can make us a success and yet not let go of the things that brought us here in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the ongoing sort of battle that uh, that, sure. uh, that you, what, manatees or no manatees that we uh, that we yeah. face. Plus, of course, there was funny stuff to write about too. Oh my God, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into some of that. Uh, rest assured. So um, this is talking animals. If you just tuned in, we're speaking with Craig Pittman. Staff writer with the St. Petersburg Times, uh, whose latest book is Manatee Insanity. Uh, we invite you to join the conversation by calling 813-239-9663 or uh, emailing us at dj at wmnf.org. So, so part of, I mean, it is a big sprawling story, as you say, I mean, we, or as we've already touched on it, it's in the 1800s and here we are, uh, 2010. But, but the book, to me, also is notable, you know, beyond that... Um, in all kinds of ways, really, not least that the, there's just striking sort of, uh, as I said earlier in the introduction, um, breadth and depth. I mean, uh, I saw where someone said the book was sort of marked by, by tour de force reporting. Um, okay, that was me, but still. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, really, I mean, for you was like, there's, you know, because you're a reporter or otherwise, did you really feel like, you know, just doing a really good job or getting a couple of good slices of this just that's just not going to work for me. I, I, I've got to really dig in every step of the way, every generation, every era. I mean, w w was that kind of the driving thing? It's like, hey, well, what else? What else? Well, it seems like yeah. And I, mean, I, I think the interesting for me, the standard for a good story is when it's when you think it's just about as weird as it can get, it gets weirder. Yeah. Uh, and that was the case with the manatee story. You know, I, I went into it thinking, okay, I pretty much know how this is going to go, and I started digging into some of the history and went. I had wow! Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Wow, that's interesting. What were, what were a couple of at least early on? What were a couple of the bigger surprises that uh, that is used? Well, that the just historically that the very first law passed to protect manatees was sponsored by a guy who was South Florida's first real estate mogul and was an avid boater himself for a guy named Frederick Morris, one, yeah. one of the founders of uh, of Miami. I mean, that was just a interesting revelation, and and that that would happen in 1893, not that long ago, but still before Miami was even a city. Right. So, um, and then, you know, just sort of the role of some of the scientists in working on this, uh, discovering, you know, hey, we can we can identify one manatee from the other based on the pattern of, uh, of boat injuries. Yeah. That suffered, the scars on their hides, you know, like uh, one of them said, you know, like fingerprints that were carved out by a buzz saw. Um, you know that that was a really fascinating thing to find out, and that that, that discovery in 1949 is something we're still using today. Now the, you know the the scar catalog, as they call it, is a computerized database, but they're still using that same method. Yeah, which of course I I, I thought was both uh, simultaneously sad and ingenious at the mm -hmm. same time when I when I read about that in, in your book. It's, uh, um, but you know it makes sense when you think about it. Sure. I mean, it's kind of awful to think about it in a way. But I mean, yeah, I guess That's nobody gets hit by the propeller exactly the same way. I yeah. guess is uh, sort or of the same effect. number of times. Yeah. But uh, but I mean, it's it's a way to take something bad and turn it into a positive, which has also kind of been sort of one of the themes here as well. That they, yeah. because of that scar catalog, they have a, a a greater understanding of this species than any other marine mammal species on Earth. Yeah. Well, that's a, the other thing too is that that throughout the the book and throughout the you know the period that the book's looking at, um, as you kind of alluded to, I mean, there's some really interesting uh, scientific work that's done, and, and people who migrate from other fields, like for example, the the guy who sort of did a lot of the key work in like figuring out how to to, to count the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it just seems like uh, because uh, again, it just seems like a one through line here is that people of all kinds and and even with all agendas uh, are really drawn to you know manatees in one capacity. They want to work with them. They want to figure them out. They want to help them. They don't really want to help. They want to help figure out how to not help them. <laughs> you know. But I mean, there's there's like a weird drive like yeah. throughout. Um, you know, just endless characters. And part of the thing, well, let's. Uh, Looks like we've got some um, folks here. Let's take a call and uh, get other people involved in the conversation. Hi, you're on WNF on Talking Animals with Craig Pittman. The argument was that uh, the, the regulations were going too far, that uh, the manatees didn't require that much protection, and that they were actually impacting people's property rights. Uh, in fact, the opening scene of the book takes place at a big public hearing where 3,000 people showed up to complain about some new regulations on dock building, and one guy actually brought a 12-foot high cross 
that was labeled property rights. Uh, so uh, people feel very strongly about, hey, the government shouldn't be telling me where I can build or what I can build. I ought to be able to build docks in my backyard. And, and uh, you know, one woman actually said that this manatee creature is infringing on my habitat. So that was the, you know, that was the position that a lot of folks were taking. And uh, frankly, the boating industry and the waterfront development industry both make very large campaign contributions. So of course, politicians listen to them. Uh, that's a really good question. The only place in the country where you can actually swim with the manatees and touch them and so forth is at Crystal River. Uh, and that's because they started doing that practice before the Endangered Species Act was passed. Other places, yes, they are, they're grandfathered in. And it's been controversial. There, there have been lots of uh, incidents where uh, some of the tour boat folks uh, have gone, pardon the pun, gone overboard with manatees. Uh, uh, where in one instance one of the tour boat operators actually grabbed a baby manatee and swung it around so it could pose for a picture for the uh -huh. tourists with the cameras and then turned it loose to swim back to its mother. And some activists who were in Crystal River who had been upset about this stuff filmed that and put it on YouTube and said, see Fish and Wildlife Service, you need to shut this stuff down. And the tour boat folks say, hey, it's just some bad apples, you know, uh -huh. don't shut us all down. If you do that, you will ruin the cause of manatee education and manatee conservation, not to mention the economy of Crystal River. So it's, it's been a real uh, source of conflict. On the other hand, as the tour boat folks point out, it is a way for people to really connect with this creature in a, in a, in a way they can't anywhere else. And they can actually see them up close, see how docile they are, how gentle. Uh, and uh, it makes an impression that you never forget. And, and let me uh, maybe just try to say thanks so much for the call. Um, but let me actually maybe uh, take even a step further philosophically perhaps from, from the caller's question is, um, is there sort of a view of that? I mean, let's put it this way. When there's swim with dolphins programs, for people who do that and love that and so that's kind of a cool connection. I mean, there's a lot of people who, you know, care about dolphins and dolphin welfare who would say you should never swim with dolphins. Right. So is that comparable in the manatee world or, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, how habituated do you want to make them to people, number one. But the other thing, too, is manatees are classified as an endangered species. And right. in other places, you know, around the state, I'm sure would love to have these kind of tour operators, except that touching manatees is classified as harassment. Uh, anywhere and, other than... Yeah, anywhere other than Crystal River. And wow. so it, it's illegal. Okay. Uh, so, you know, then you look at, okay, well, if it's illegal everywhere else, how come it's legal in this one place just because they did it before the law was passed? You know, how do you... How do you reconcile those things? Is it harassment or is it not? Right. Wow. Okay. So that is uh, sounds like very much a parallel to the. Uh, sure. Interesting. Um, and and uh, you alluded a bit ago to you know it's obviously getting uh, colder here and I heard this morning coming in that um, uh, tomorrow with wind chill could be in the mid 30s or thereabouts. Yeah. So what um, what might nearby. Um, Manatees do or be doing now in response to the chilly temperatures. They're probably already headed for for the warm water offal. So they headed for for uh, springs, for instance, in Sulphur Springs. Uh, there's a, a a boil that comes up in the river there where they like to hang out. Uh, in uh, uh, the, obviously the ones that people know about the most are the uh, power plants because the manatees are attracted there by the warm water that flows out from the, the power plants. And and you'll see you know, a uh, hundred or so of them gathered around some of those areas. And that's why those are, that's a good time for the biologists to take to the air and fly around and try and count yeah. them and, and contain their nausea as they <laughs> circle 16 right. times with the, you know, standing on the wing. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, that's, you know, that, that came up a few times in, in, in the book, obviously, that, the counting and, and the nausea. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so are they always kind of, uh, the people who do that counting, at the ready, so that if a cold snap comes in quickly, boom, they're they're ready they're, the next. They're, well, they're watching the weather. And they're yeah. looking for specific patterns. Patterns. Come in. Yeah. yeah. If it's if it's a cold snap, it's going to be over in a day or two. No, they don't they don't deal with that. But right. it's going to last Sustained. for a little while, and then they're looking for a, a you know a sunny day because on a sunny day the manatees would tend to come to the surface sure. and to warm themselves. That makes it easier for the nice town. Nice time. So those are the ideal sort of circumstances. Gotcha. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and with this sort of movement that's happening now because of the cold weather, I mean, what sort of different precautions, uh, in theory at least, should local boaters, you know, think about making? Well, I mean, obviously obey all the, all the posted speed zones and so forth, 